How many of you recycle at home? Pretty good. Of those who raise their hands, shout out a reason or two why you recycle. The landfill. Landfill. Reduce. Daughter nags. <laughs> That's what got me into it is sudden daughter nagging. Saves resources. Saves resources. Better for the environment. Better for the environment. Cost effective. Cost effective. Just because. Just because. Now why might you not recycle? Expensive. 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 Waste products. Waste products. Ignorance. Ignorance. Inconvenient. Too much trouble. Too much trouble. Doesn't make money. <laughs> Everything you've just said, pro and con, applies to recycling nuclear fuel. Plus a few things that are unique to nuclear used fuel, which we'll get into. Now, the way I'd like to conduct this is if something's not clear, you've got questions as I go along, don't wait till the end. Just share your question. Throw something at me if I'm not looking in your direction. Because I want this to be a conversation, not some sort of formal lecture. Now, it would be even better if everyone came down front, but I'm kind of guessing that no one's going to do that. <clears throat> so I won't ask. I'll just give you permission. Just to start off with some basics on nuclear energy. It's an established technology. We've got over 400 plants around the world. We've got about 100 in the US generating 19% of our electricity. Nuclear energy is not brand new. It's been around and it continues to expand and will expand in the coming decades. A typical nuclear power plant, the active part of the plant way down here and all the rest is to protect the environment from the plant as well as to protect the plant from things going on outside. These are large plants nowadays. They're expensive. They're very well engineered, very well designed, very well maintained. Each of us in this room carries around a replica of a nuclear fuel pellet. Did you know that? No. Take your finger, not even up to your first joint, that's roughly the size of a fuel pellet. That little part of your finger has the energy content of almost a ton of coal. Did you know your fingers were that powerful? <laughs> really? They are. The fundamental thing about nuclear power is that it is concentrated. That's good. It saves money. It saves the environment because there's less stuff that has to be dug out of the ground. It's also a problem because the waste is therefore comp uh, that much concentrated. Because everything that starts in this pellet basically stays in that pellet. So all the waste products build up inside of it. When it comes out of a reactor, fuel goes into wet storage. These are large facilities with a lot of water that's on top. And more and more, because we don't yet have a final disposal option in the US, we put them in large dry storage facilities. Look at the size here. These are tall fences. These are big containers. Sure. If they're in the previous slide, you showed them in the water. Yes. And now they're in dry how? There's a drying process. After they've cooled for several years, then the utility, the person who operates the plant, will move them in here if they need to make more room in their, their wet storage facility for new used fuel. They cost money to do this. So Up there. Good question. I don't know. Someone here may know. The question was, how many pellets in one of these? 
it depends on the size of the facility and so forth. Down here. So I don't think you answered the question about is wet storage just as useful as dry storage, or why would you do one over the other? You start with wet because the fuel is hot when you come out of the reactor. It therefore needs to be cooled by water circulating past the fuel. Once it's cooled for at least five years, then it's cold enough or, or, or less hot and can be moved into here if the utility needs to, to make more room for more fuel coming out of the reactor. I turn my stove off, we don't have to keep cooling it. Why do we have to keep cooling this? <laughs> because of the things called fission products. Uranium is the metal at the beginning of the fuel uh, as it goes in the reactor. When it comes out, around 93, 94 percent of that metal is still uranium. Some of it has gone to elements in the periodic table past uranium called transuranics. Most of that is plutonium. And then around 5 percent are what we call fission products. Those are radioactive. They generate heat and the amount of heat they generate decreases with time. The instant the reactor is turned off, it's generating 7 percent of the heat due to the fission products as well as some of the uranium and plutonium that it did when it was on. So it starts off hot and then comes down with time. And, and I'll quantify some of that pretty soon here. So that's basics. We've got a material goes into the reactor, it comes out. 95 percent of that material when it comes out is still useful material. It could be put back into a reactor if those fission products are taken away. So why might one recycle? There's a lot of energy in that material. If you take all the used fuel that's accumulated in the United States, just take the plutonium that's in it, you've got more than the oil equivalent of Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, 4 percent of Saudi Arabia. Now if I take the uranium and plutonium that's in the used fuel that is already sitting around the country, I'm almost up to the energy equivalent of the world oil reserves. There's a lot of energy in those pellets. Several hundred. I mean, well, in, in a fuel assembly, in one rod, it's a couple of dozen. Okay. Now, this case requires more advanced reactors than we use in this country today. The world leader in fast reactors, anyone want to take a guess what country that is? France. France. Russia. Russia. John's right. Russia. Ten years ago, I would have said Japan. It's Russia now. They're moving uh, pretty fast in that department. Now, to make the fuel that goes into the reactors, you also have to process the uranium and do what's called uranium enrichment, which has been in the news recently, thanks to the Iranians. So we've got a lot of material in storage already in the United States that's called depleted uranium. If we have fast reactors, that material can also be used as fuel. And if we use the depleted uranium that's already mined in the United States, nine times the world energy oil equivalent of the oil, the oil reserves for the whole world. So why do we recycle? There's a lot of energy in that material. Now, we got questions about the heat. This is what's called radiotoxicity. If I plotted the, the curve for heat, it would look almost identically the same. This black line here represents how radioactive, how radiotoxic uranium ore is. <clears throat> and everything else that's on here is relative to uranium ore. When used fuel comes out of the reactor, 
1,000. It's a million times more radiotoxic than uranium ore is. And roughly that much in terms of heat relative to the small amount of heat that's generated in the ground naturally from uranium ore. When it starts decaying, 1, 10, 100, 1,000 years, it starts cooling off. Now what in the used fuel is causing it to be toxic? Well, here's uranium and the transuranics, plutonium and so forth. These are the elements cesium and strontium. Down here we have technetium and iodine. These are types of fission products and everything else is here in blue. Before this stuff becomes less radioactive than the used, I mean than the uranium ore that started the whole process, takes about a million years, almost a million years. Now, that's a long time. Compare that, by the way, to some other energy options where the same number would be infinite. If I have beryllium, if I have chromium, I have all kinds of toxic chemical elements, they're, most of those are toxic forever. So at least this decays with time. Now, the policy in the United States right now is not to recycle, but to instead throw it away. That phrase, by the way, was used in this context by the General Accounting Office over 20 years ago. The disposal challenge is that you have to design for high heat for the first centuries. It's very toxic. It sticks around as a toxic problem for a long duration. And the chemistry is very toxic or very complicated. No one anywhere in the world has a disposal site for this material in operation. There are no precedents. Now if we recycle plutonium, which is what the French are doing, and the Japanese and the Russians, we reduce the time scale a bit from getting close to a million years down to 20,000 years, which is an improvement, but it hasn't really changed the problem. Instead, you want to recycle all of these materials, uranium and all the transuranics, not just plutonium. If you do that, then the time scale drops to 1,000 years. Now, we don't have a 1,000 year design facility for this type of material. It's high heat, still high heat, still highly toxic, but it's a much shorter duration and the chemistry is a little simpler. We now, however, are in the regime of some human-made structures that have lasted that long. So there's not a precedent for a waste disposal facility of this type, but there are things that humans have made that have lasted this long. My wife Robin and I, for example, several years ago in Italy visited the Colosseum, and I'm referring to the Colosseum in Verona, Italy, not Rome. Because as interesting as the Colosseum in Rome is, it's not in use. The Colosseum in Verona, Italy is. Almost 2,000 years, still in use. And we can do better than this. <clears throat> this is what's driving heat, cesium and strontium. This is what's driving the long-term hazard once I recycle the uranium and plutonium. So if I take those things out and create another waste stream, now I've made things more complicated, but I have precedence for every type of waste that I would make. The technetium iodine and some of the impurities that would go with those, now we have a precedent in the United States called the Waste Isolation Pilot Project down in New Mexico. We also have precedents here in Idaho. There are facilities here that when they were decommissioned, they were called entombed. So the original waste calcina, for example, was cleaned out as much as they could. They imploded it, covered it, 
capped it with concrete, and it's essentially a technetium iodine waste site. And it's staying there. Cesium and strontium, the Swedish facility SFR, which is in operation, is storage for this type of material. And then the, what's left are, would qualify for near surface burial. So we have a way to take several steps, do recycling, and then what we don't recycle, we put it in a precedence into facilities for which there are precedents. And I'll go back to our family house. We recycle everything we can. What we can't recycle, we do different things with. Some of it goes in the trash. Some of it goes out to the compost pile. And the leftovers go to me. 